Hi folks, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk to you about charges and Coulomb's law. Our objectives are going to be to describe the types of charges and their attraction or repulsion, to describe polarization and induced charges, to calculate the magnitude and direction of the force on a positive or negative charge due to other point charges, to define and calculate the electric field due to one or more point charges, and finally, to interpret electric field diagrams. So let's dive in. Electric charge is a fundamental property of certain particles, and the smallest amount of isolatable electric charge is the elementary charge, or 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Protons have a charge of plus 1 e, or plus 1 elementary charge, and electrons, as you know, have a charge of negative 1 elementary charge. Neutrons don't have any charge, they're neutral. Atoms that have an excess of protons or electrons that have an overall net charge are known as ions. Now, as we talk about conductors and insulators, the difference between them, charges are allowed to move freely in conductors. In insulators, wherever a charge is, it's pretty much stuck there. It can't move freely. That's the big difference between the two. Now, as we talk about polarization electric dipole moment, what happens when a charged object is brought near a conductor? Well, if we look down here in the lower left, if we bring this positively charged rod over toward the conductor, the positive charges in the rod are going to attract the electrons, the opposite charges in the conductor. They're going to come over to the side of the charged rod, leaving net positive charge on the other side of the conductor. We have induced a separation of charge. Now, on the other hand, if we look at what happens with the same scenario, but an insulator, on the bottom right here, we have a charged rod, positive, coming near an insulator. Now, the charges aren't free to move in an insulator, but as that rod gets close, what the electrons in the atoms near it can do, they can spend just a little more time on the side of the charged rod, which they're more attracted to. You again get a net induced charge, a net separation of charge. The distance between the shifted positive and negative charges, multiplied by the charge itself, is known as the electric dipole moment. When we talk about conduction and induction, charging by contact is conduction. Very straightforward. If a charged conductor is brought into contact with an identical net neutral conductor, the net charge will be shared across the two conductors. They come in contact conduction. Charging an object without placing it in contact with another charged object is known as induction. And here I want to show you an example that you can do with an electroscope. We have a neutral electroscope over here, basically a glass beaker that has a metal rod down the middle and two foil leaves at the bottom. Its net charge is neutral when you start out. But if you bring a positively charged rod near it, the electrons in the conductive path here all want to come near the positive charge. They're attracted. That leaves a net positive charge as the electrons move away down here in the leaves and the leaves spread apart. Once you do that, though, you can charge up this electroscope without ever touching the charge rod to it. And the way you do that is once you have this charge separated, you then attach a ground wire, a wire to the ground of the earth, or typically a pipe that's sunk into the earth quite a ways. And the earth acts like an infinite sink or source of electrons. If you have extra, you can put them into the earth. If you don't have enough, you can suck them up from the earth. So when you do that, the electrons come into the ball, the closest part of the electroscope, near the positively charged rod, as you have this charge evening out. If you then disconnect it before you move the rod away, then move the rod away, you have brought an excess of electrons into the electroscope. The electroscope is now charged negatively, and you never touched the charged rod to it, charging by induction. Let's talk about electric force and Coulomb's law. As you know, like charges repel and opposites attract. Positive and a positive, they want to push each other apart. Negative, negative, push each other apart. But if you have a positive and a negative, they attract each other. Coulomb's law describes the magnitude of the force between those charges. Coulomb's law states that 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, all of that is just a constant, times the first charge, times the second charge, divided by the square of the distance between them is equal to the magnitude of the attractive or repulsive force. Now, this epsilon naught number, that's called the permittivity of free space. It's a constant, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulomb squared per newton meter squared. 
And you might have seen this entire 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught written differently in the past. Oftentimes you'll see Coulomb's law written as the electric force is equal to k times q1 times q2 over r squared, where k is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. So k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon zero, epsilon naught. So why do we write it that way? Later on, for purposes of symmetry, as we start diving into where these formulas come from and other derivations, it'll make things a little bit easier now that we're using calculus. All right, let's move on. The electric field describes the amount of electrostatic force observed by a charge that's placed in that field per unit charge. The electric field vector points in the direction a positive test charge would feel a force. So the electric field strength, E, is equal to the force divided by that test charge, or force is equal to charge times the electric field. And if we go back to E equals F over Q and we plug in Coulomb's law for the force, we get that the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge causing that field divided by the square of the distance from that charge to the point in space where you're trying to measure the field. Now electric fields follow the law of superposition. If you want to know what the field is due to several different point charges, find the field due to each of those point charges and just add them up. All right, electric field lines. Electric field lines indicate the direction of the electric force on a positive test charge. So if we have a positive test charge here, anywhere I might place another positive charge, say right there, it's going to feel a force up, away. If I put it down here, it's going to feel a force that way. That's what electric field lines show. They always go away from positive charges and toward negative charges. So over here on the right, we have our negative charge. If we put a positive charge in that field, that positive charge would want to go toward the negative, so the arrows point in. And down below, you can see electric field configurations for other two charge systems, a positive and a negative, where the field lines come from the positive to the negative, and a positive and a positive, where the field lines are going away from the positives. And of course, right in between those two, if you could get perfectly between them and their identical charges, you would have a region where there is no electric field. The net electric field is zero. Let's take a look at how we can apply this for a couple problems. Our first problem here, find the electric field at the origin due to the three point charges shown. And we've got a plus two Coulomb charge, a green one here at zero comma eight, a plus one Coulomb charge in blue here at two two, and a minus two Coulomb charge here at eight comma zero in red. Well, our strategy is going to be to add up the electric fields due to each of those individual charges. So let's figure out the electric field at the origin, our point of interest here, due to our green charge there, the plus two coulombs. We'll call that E1, and that's going to be equal to one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is 9 times 10 to the 9th. So that's 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared times our charge plus 2 Coulombs over the square of the distance from the origin, 8 meters squared. Or when I put that in vector form, it's easy to see that the direction is going to be down at that point, positive charge, electric field lines point away. So the x component is going to be zero, and the entire magnitude is going to be the y component, or, since it's down, negative 2.81 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb, our units of electric field. Let's try the same thing for that blue charge there. We'll call that electric field due to charge two, one over four pi epsilon naught, Q over R squared, or again, nine times 10 to the ninth, times our charge, one Coulomb. Ah, the distance here, we've got to use the Pythagorean theorem. That's going to be the square root of two squared plus two squared squared, or when I put this into the uh, 
calculator, I'm going to come up with a magnitude of about 1.13 times 10 to the ninth newtons per coulomb. But I want to break that up into component form because it's pretty easy to see that since that's a positive charge, the field's going to be pointing away from it at the origin. I have to have x and y components. So I'll multiply this by the cosine of 45. So that's going to be 1.13 times 10 to the ninth cosine 45 degrees for the x component. And since it's going to the left, that'll be negative. And 1.13 times 10 to the ninth sine 45 degrees. And since that's going down, that will be negative newtons per coulomb. Or when I do the math, that's going to come out to be, let's see here, about negative 7.95 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb in the x and the y. All right, and finally, we have the field due to this negative 2 coulomb charge in red down here. So for that one, it's easy to see if that's a negative charge, the electric field's going to point to the right at the origin due to that charge. We'll call that electric field due to charge 3. That's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared, or again, 9 times 10 to the ninth times our charge q negative 2 over r squared, 8 squared, which gives me a magnitude, again, of 2.81 times 10 to the eighth. And since that's just in the x direction and to the right, I can write that as 2.81 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb and no y component. So then how do I get the total electric field due to all of these charges? Well, to do that, the total electric field is just going to be the sum of the components of these. So as I come to get the total electric field, let me switch to a dark blue color so that shows up a little bit better. The x component is going to be that x component plus that x component plus that x component. When I add those up, I come up with negative 5.14 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb in the x. And for the y, well, we add up the y components of the three electric field vectors. We've got that one, that one, and that one. Put all of those together, and I come up with negative 1.08 times 10 to the ninth newtons per coulomb. So there is our net electric field at the origin due to those three charges. Let's try one more problem. Same concept, just applied a little bit differently. We want to know where the electric field is zero due to these two point charges. They're all on the x-axis, so we're only dealing with problems in one dimension. Where is the electric field zero? Well, the charge from the field from both of these is going to be pointing toward each other. If the field goes away, so there should be a point between them where they cancel out. And I would guess it's going to be a little bit closer to the 1 Coulomb charge than the 2 Coulomb charge because the red one, that's a little bit stronger. So we're probably looking at something over in that sort of region. So let's call that our x. Uh, let's actually change that. Let's make that r just so we don't confuse with our x-axis. Now, the remaining distance here must be 11 minus r. So let's figure out the electric field due to our plus one Coulomb charge. E1 is going to be one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. In this case, since Q is one Coulomb, that's gonna be one over four pi epsilon naught times one over R squared. That's pointing to the right. Now, due to the red charge, we're going to have electric field at 2, which will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times our charge, Q, in this case, 2 coulombs, divided by the distance, in this case, 11 minus R squared. So that will be 2 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 11 minus R squared. 
where the electric field is zero, the magnitude of these two is going to cancel out. The magnitudes will be equal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set those equal. And I'm also going to make life a little simpler for me. And I'm just going to replace 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught in both of these problems with k. So that's going to leave me with, I have k over r squared must be equal to 2k over 11 minus r quantity squared. Now all I have to do is solve for r. Well, I can divide the k's out, and I get 1 over r squared equals 2 over 11 minus r squared. Or cross multiply to say that 2r squared equals, well, 11 minus r quantity squared. That's going to be 121 minus 22r plus r squared. All right, I can subtract an r squared from both sides. That term will go away. That will go away. And I come up with an equation that looks like r squared plus 22r minus 121 must equal 0, a quadratic equation. I can go to my quadratic formula or my calculator, solve that to find that r is equal to 4.56. So that means this distance here, distance here is 4.56 units from negative 6. So the x value where that occurs, x must be equal to negative 6 plus 4.56. So I get an x value of about negative 1.44 meters. And if I go check, that would show up here on my drawing right about there, pretty close to where we estimated we should see that. Hopefully that gets you started with charges and Coulomb's law. If you need more help looking for answers to questions, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks for your time and make it a great day.